very good morning and a warm welcome again to what would be our normal Sunday morning if things were normal uh, in the in the world we would be normally meeting together uh, at half past ten and eleven o'clock on a Sunday morning in the Bethel Bush in Clirac and we would be enjoying fellowship and we would be worshipping God together uh, but while we are unable to do that and hopefully the time is coming soon when we can uh, continue to do that but while we are unable to do that we're going to spend uh, these moments as we have done over these last uh, 10 or 12 weeks coming around the word of God and specifically looking at Mark's gospel uh, together this morning. We're looking at Mark and chapter 11 and last week if you uh, joined me we look at, looked at the very big topic of forgiveness both uh, the forgiveness that we receive from God or have received from God and his command for us to forgive one another. That's what we looked at last week. And so this week I'd like us to continue in Mark chapter 11. Uh, and we are specifically this morning looking at the conversation that Jesus has in Jerusalem with some of the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. In a society like Israel's was, which was built around the national faith and the national religion, then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders wouldn't have just been a religious position. It would have been the leaders or they would have been the leaders of the Jewish community. So Jesus was talking to some very important people in Jerusalem on this day. And so we're going to read together from Mark chapter 11. And I just want to read two verses, really. Verses 27 and verses 28. Mark 11 verse 27 says, Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority to do these things? Now this morning I'm going to stop reading there, um, for this week anyway, because it's just the question that is asked of Jesus that I want to consider and spend some time considering this morning. Not so much the answer, but just the question. And so these very important people, these high-ranking officials in Jerusalem, in Israel at the time, they come to Jesus as he is walking through Jerusalem, as he is in the temple uh, once again. And they say to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do these things. Now we can ask ourselves or we can wonder or ponder this morning, what are they talking about when they say these things? So when they say to Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Well, what do they mean by these things? And I suppose that we could understand that to mean the things that Jesus is doing. And he's done a lot, hasn't he? Particularly in Mark over these last three years of his earthly ministry. He's been doing wonderful miracles uh, and signs, wonderful healings. And so he has been busy uh, doing his father's work, as he has told his disciples. And then he has been talking a lot. And particularly in Mark chapter 11, he talks an awful lot. And so the things that, these things that these chief priests and elders and scribes are talking about, they are the things that Jesus both is doing and the things that he is saying. You know, it's, um, when you think about it, it's a, a very relevant question that these chief priests and scribes and elders, these leaders of the Jewish community, ask Jesus. Look, they say, you, you were saying some outrageous things, some radical things, some very, very different things, and you're doing some very strange things and memorable things and outrageous things. By what authority? Are you doing them? What gives you the right to do these things? And when you think of what Jesus was saying, it, it is perhaps a, a fair question that these elders, these rulers, these leaders have asked him. When you consider some of the things, particularly that Jesus says during his earthly ministry. You know, we could look at, at two or three of them. Uh, this morning he told Nicodemus, who was another ruler of the Jews, that he must be born again, which was very strange, very new, very radical teaching. He tells his disciples that he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to God 
except through him. He told the crowd in John's gospel, this is the work of God, he says to them, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. So he tells people to believe and accept and have faith in him. On, in a, on another occasion, a very famous occasion, he tells the wind and the waves, which were, which were blowing, the waves that were rocking the boat, he talks to them and says to them, peace be still. He told the man who he healed of an infirmity or a disability, he says to him, your sins are forgiven you. Now that's a very controversial thing to say and one which caused him or which got him an awful lot of criticism. So Jesus in these last three years has been saying really difficult things, challenging things. And the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, the leaders of Jerusalem, the leaders of Israel are, are basically saying to him, where did you get the authority to say these things? What gives you the right to say to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What gives you the right to say, you must be born again? What gives you the right to say, the work of God is to believe in the one that he has sent? What gives you the right to speak to the, the wind and with the waves and rebuke them? You know, and particularly, what gives you the right to think that you can forgive sins? You know, basically, what these, these leaders were saying to, them, to him is, who do you think you are? What, what right do you have to say these very, very challenging things? You know, and it, it is perhaps an understandable question, a sensible question from these rulers of Jerusalem, because ordinary people like you and me, we just don't go around saying things like that. You know, when was the last time that you talked to the wind and the waves? When was the last time that you told people that you were the way and that you were the truth and that you were the life? When was the last time that you said to someone with authority, look, your sins are forgiven you? Normal people like you and me and like, even like these rulers of Jerusalem don't go around saying these things, but Jesus did. Jesus went around saying these things and so the leaders of Jerusalem in this passage are saying to him, well, what gives you the right? What gives you the authority to go around saying things like that? Because normal people, ordinary people, don't speak like that. You know, and they don't speak like that because they have no right to speak like that. You know, if I were to say to you, I am the way this morning, I'm the truth and the life, and I was to tell you to put your faith in me and your trust in me, and I have the authority to forgive sins, then I would expect you to challenge me on that and say, look, you have no right. You have no authority. You have no right to say those things because those things are not true of you. And yet Jesus did. And he does it in a very different way to what everyone else would say. Now, Jesus says, I am the way. But the Bible would tell us that God is the way. Believe in me, says Jesus, but the Bible would command us to believe in God. I forgive you, says Jesus, but the Bible would tell us, as we look at it this morning, that it is God alone who can forgive. And after one of these teachings, these um, controversial things that Jesus says, um, the gospel writers tell us that the Jews, after hearing him say things like this, took up stones to stone him and to kill him because they were so incensed. And when he asked them why they were so angry, why they were so incensed, for, for what act or for what action or for what good work, he says, do you stone me? Then they say to him, for no work, for no good work, but because you, being a man, are making yourself out to be God. You know, and that's what these Jewish leaders were saying of him as they have this conversation, as they direct this question to him. Who do you think you are going round telling people that you are the way, the truth and the life? Who do you think you are telling people to believe in you and trust in you and follow you? Who do you think you are telling people that you can forgive them? You, a man, are putting yourself in the place of God. 
you know, and that is a very dangerous thing to do. And so it's an important question that these Jewish leaders are asking of Jesus here. Who do you think you are? What is giving you the right to say these things? You know, it's not only an important question for the Jewish authorities, it's an important question for you and me too. Because Jesus is talking to us about some really important things. He's talking to us about issues that will affect our lives and our hearts and our family and our forgiveness and our standing before God and even our eternal destiny, where we will spend our eternity, are the things that Jesus is talking about. He is demanding of you and me this morning as we read his words, our faith and our trust. Believe in me is his command to you and me. Put your faith in me and your trust in me. Follow me is his command to you and me this morning. So perhaps a question that we can ask quite rightly and quite sensibly is on what authority, Jesus, are you doing that? Who, do you, who does he think he is asking that of me? No, Jesus asked a, a similar question of his disciples. A couple of chapters uh, back in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 8, he asked Jesus, he asked his disciples two questions. He says, first of all, who do men say that I am? And then he asks them, well, who do you say that I am? Now, if we were to do that this morning, I wonder what our answers would be. If we were to ask the world, well, who is Jesus? Who do you consider him to be? If we were to ask men and women, well, who is Jesus? We ask that question of the world. Who do we as humanity consider Jesus to be? We would have some different answers, I suppose, dependent on who we ask. Now, if we asked a large percentage of our nation and even our world, well, who is Jesus? Many would come back and say, well, he was an exceptionally good man. He was a man who stood out in his life, in his generation, in his community. He was a wonderful teacher. He said the most wonderful things about love and mercy and grace and forgiveness and all these wonderful things. He was a great man. He was a great teacher. And because of that, he has left a wonderful inspiration to you and me, a great example to you and me that we should learn from him and that we should follow him. That's who he is, many people would say. Someone who lived up to God's laws, someone who lived up to God's expectations, someone who lived an exceptionally good life and who lived a life on God's terms, someone who lived a life close to God, closer than anyone else has in all of human history. You know, and if that is who he is this morning, and if we can only go that far and say, yes, he is a great man, a great teacher, and a great example, and we were to go no further, then Jesus becomes many things to you and me. He becomes a great example Someone that we can look up to and someone that we could follow, someone that we could learn from. He becomes a great example to you and me. And if more people were like him, perhaps we would think that our societies and our world would be a, a better place. Someone to learn from, someone to admire. But really, if that's all that Jesus is, he has no right, really, to say the things or make the demands or the commands that he does of me. Now, Jesus is a good example, yes, but he has no right to, believe, for, to ask me to believe in him if that's all he is. You know, I can look up to him, but he has no right to ask me to follow him wherever he goes. He has no right to, to claim that he can forgive me of my sins or that he can deal with with my sins, or that he can help me with my sins in any way. No, because that is what God does. The forgiveness of sins is the domain, the responsibility of God. And if Jesus is just a good example, then he has no right to claim that he can forgive me or help me 
in my sin, in my standing before God. He has no right, if he is just a good example and a great man, he has no right to stand in the place of God on my behalf. Now the world has been full of great men and women down throughout the generations. There are countless men and women that we could say are a great example to us and a great inspiration to us and we can look up to them. You know, and Jesus, for many people, can join the ranks of those great men and great women, but that's about as far as it goes. He can't offer me forgiveness. He can't offer me grace. He can't offer me fellowship with God because those things are not within his authority if he is just a great man. Those things are not within the power and the authority of great men and women. Those things belong to God. You know, and in fact, it is a terrible thing and a dangerous thing for a great man or a great woman to get ideas above their station and to attempt to put themselves in the place of God. You know, in fact, there's a story about it, about an example of that in the New Testament. Israel had a very famous king, and in fact, a very fam famous uh, dynasty of kings called the Herods. And one of these kings called Herod was a great and a powerful man. And we are told in the, the New Testament that he had great uh, talents. He was able to do wonderful things. And one of the things that he could do really well is he could speak. He was a wonderful public speaker. And in the New Testament, there is a story of this king called Herod uh, one day delivering a speech that is so mighty and so powerful that the crowds who heard it were so impressed with it, they shouted out, this is not just a man, this is a god. He is so mighty, he's so powerful in what he's saying and how he's saying it. He goes beyond a great man. He must be more than a man. This is a god. You know, and Herod should have said to that crowd, look, you've gone too far. I might be a great man. I might be a great public speaker. I may have worked hard in getting this speech together and I might have delivered it wonderfully well, but that's as far as it goes. But Herod enjoyed this adoration and he liked the adoration and the worship of this crowd as they were saying this is not just a man this is a god and so he accepted it and he stood for a moment in the place of god in a place that he had no right to be and the bible tells us that god struck him down in the most terrifying of ways the most awful of ways and you can read about it in the New Testament. You know, to stand in the place of God is no place for a man or a woman, even a great and a wonderful one. And if Jesus is a great man, and that's as far as it goes, then he cannot stand in the place of God. And so he has nothing to say to me about forgiveness or mercy or grace or salvation or my standing in the kingdom of God. If he is a great man, who do you say that I am was the question of Jesus. And to so many people, he is a great man, but that's all he is. But what if Jesus is more than a great man? And what if we were to elevate him higher than that this morning? Elevate him perhaps to the level of angels and maybe even not just to any old angels, but what if we were to say that he is at the greatest level of angels, that God has created him to be higher than any other created thing. And so he is above humanity, he is above the greatest of humanity, he is above the angels, he is above the greatest of angels. In all of creation, he is the number one, the, the highest of created beings what if we were to elevate him to that status and say well look god has created jesus to be higher than any other created thing well i'm no expert in this 
this morning, but I understand that that would be a Jehovah's Witnesses answer to that question. Who do you say that I am? Well, Jesus is a created being, but created greater, more wonderful, more powerful at a higher level than any other part of creation. Now, just as an aside, I'm listening to a, a wonderful set of sermons at the moment. Uh, on the book of Hebrews that is being run by Emmanuel Christian Fellowship on their Facebook page. And so I would recommend them to you if you want to understand more of what the Bible says about comparing Jesus with angels. I would heartily recommend that you go and listen to them. But for our purposes this morning, what if we were to do that? What if we were to say, well, he is greater than a great man and we put him up there on the level of the angels, the greatest of the angels, the greatest of the created beings. But we run into a problem with that too. Because as you read the Bible, no angel has the right to say the things that Jesus has been saying either. It's not just great men who have nothing to say to us about forgiveness, can't offer us forgiveness or grace, or can't affect our, under, our uh, standing in, uh, in God. It's not just great men who have no authority to do that. It's angels. They have no authority to do that either. No angel has the right to say things that Jesus has been saying. No created being no matter how great and how wonderful, can proclaim himself to be the way and the truth and the life. It's above their station. No created being, no matter how wonderful they are, can proclaim himself or herself to be the way of salvation. No created be being can offer me forgiveness or offer me fellowship with God. Because those things are not in the power or in the authority even of angels. They belong exclusively to God. An angel can't offer you and me forgiveness this morning. An angel can't offer you and me a place in the fold and the family of God. Because those things don't belong to angels. They have no right. They have no authority. Those things are the domain of God himself. In fact, it is a terrible thing, a dangerous thing, even for an angel to get ideas above their station and to attempt to stand in the place of God. You know, there are two stories about that in the Bible that would tell us of what would happen, of the pitfalls that would happen if an angel were to dare to stand in the place of of God. You now, the first of those stories tell us about a great and a wonderful angel called Lucifer. You may be familiar with the name, who looked, who was great, and who was wonderful, and who was mighty, and who was powerful. But one, at one time, he became so enamoured by his own beauty, and his own power, and his own strength, that he, he thought he wasn't satisfied with being at the place of angels anymore, but he stood in the place of God. And the Bible tells us that God struck him down and cast him out of his presence, out of heaven. That's one example. A second example would be in the book of Revelation, when an angel shows John the most wonderful things, the most wonderful things of heaven and on earth. And at the end of the story, John is in such awe and such wonder at this angel that he bows down and worships him. But, but in this case, the angel tells John in Revelation chapter 22, and in no uncertain terms, never ever to do that. Get up, he says. No, th there is no reason to worship me. Do not worship me, says this angel, because I am just a fellow servant like you. You know, this angel, angel obviously had learnt the mistakes of Lucifer, and not for a moment was he about to repeat them. To be in the place of God is no place for an angel, even a great one. And so if we were to 
consider Jesus this morning to be a great man, then he has no right to say the things that he has been saying. Because a great man or a great woman cannot offer me forgiveness or salvation. A great man or a great woman cannot say to me, ask me to believe in them or have faith in them or follow them. If we were to say that Jesus is, is, a, is a great angel, perhaps, or the greatest of created beings, then he again has no right to say the things that he has been saying. There is no created being can offer you and me salvation this morning and can offer you and me forgiveness of sin or can alter our position in the sight of God whatsoever. And so this was a good question, a sensible question that these uh, scribes and elders and chief priests asked, asked of Jesus. What gives you the right? To say these things. What gives you the right to make these demands of me? What gives you the right to offer salvation? To offer forgiveness? To offer mercy and grace? And a position and a place in the kingdom and the family of God? Who does Jesus think he is? This Jesus who asks humanity that you and I are a part of this morning to believe in him and to trust him, and to follow him. This Jesus, who has been telling us for the last three years that he is the way, the only way of salvation, that there is no other way to God. No one comes to the Father except through him. Who is this Jesus? Who does he think he is? This man who offers forgiveness, and offers fellowship with God, and offers an eternal place, in the kingdom and in the family of God. If a great man has no right to do that, and a great angel has no right to do that, well, who is Jesus that he has the right to do that? You know, the Bible would give us a clear answer this morning. This Jesus, it says, is God himself come in the flesh to die for our sins. Not a great man come to tell us about God. Not a wonderful angel come to tell us about God. But God himself come in the flesh to die for our sins. John's Gospel would tell us that. It would tell us that uh, in the beginning he was there. And in the beginning he was with God. And in the beginning he was God. Paul would tell us in Colossians that the whole fullness of God dwells in Jesus in bodily form. Matthew would tell us that from the beginning to the end of his time here on earth, Jesus accepted the worship of men and women as God. It went far beyond a great man. It went far beyond an angel. Jesus accepted continually through his, his earthly life the worship of men and women as God. Now I could quote a number of other verses from the Bible this morning, but my favourite, if you'll indulge me, is written by Paul and it's written in Philippians 2 as he writes, as he talks about Jesus. And he writes in Philippians 2 that Jesus, being God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That Jesus, being God himself, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Remember those two examples that we talked about earlier on. Herod, he stood in the place of God on one occasion. He made himself equal with God. And it was robbery. He had no right whatsoever. It was a disgrace. It was an outrage. And he was struck down because he, just being a man, made himself out to be God, stood in the place of God. It was a robbery that he made himself to be equal with God. It was a disgrace, an outrage, and he was struck down. Because on a level with God is no place for a man or a woman, even a great and a wonderful one. 
Lucifer, as we talked about earlier on, he stood in the place of God. He made himself equal with God. It was a robbery. It was a disgrace. It was an outrage. He had no right to be there, to stand in the place of God. And he was struck down. And he was cast out of heaven, out of the presence of God. He being just a created being, a wonderful one, a mighty one, a powerful one, but a created being nonetheless had no right to stand in the place of God. No, on a level with God is no place for an angel, even a great and a powerful one. Jesus, though, through what he does and what he says, he stands in the place of God. Jesus, the one who says, look, I am the way and the truth and the life. Who does he think he is? Only God can say that. Jesus, who says to you and me, believe in me, put your faith in me, put your trust in me. Who does he think he is to say that? Because only God can say that. Jesus, who, say, who says, I forgive you of your sins. I have dealt with your sins. Now, who does he think he is saying that? Because only God can say that. Jesus, through the things that he does and the things that he says, is standing in the place of God this morning. But the difference is it is no robbery. It is no disgrace. It is no outrage. In fact, it is his proper and his rightful place. God the Father in no way strikes him down. God the Father does not cast him out in any way, shape or form. Rather, Paul would tell us this morning that God has exalted him to the highest place and has given him the name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess him as Lord. You know, when Herod stands in the place of God, then he is struck down. And when Lucifer stands in the place of God, then he is cast out. But when Jesus stands in the place of God, it is his rightful place and he is exalted to the highest place. And every knee bows before him and every tongue confesses him. Who is he? Is our question this morning. Who is he? You know, it's far from a meaningless question. It's not an academic question that we can debate but has no real effect or no real impact on our lives. It's an important question this morning. It's a vital question. Who is he? Who is he in my mind and in my heart and in my life and in my experience? Who is he to you this morning as we together are looking at Mark chapter 11. Who is he to you? You know, a great man, even a great angel, can only go so far. A great man, even a great angel, becomes useless to me when it comes to the condition of my sin and my separation from God. A great man and a great angel can do so much. But when it comes to the position of my sin and my separation from God, they can do nothing at all. A great man and even a great angel is no good to me when it comes to forgiveness of sin. When it comes to a future with God my Father. When it comes to my eternal destiny. I need someone who is greater than a great man. I need someone who is greater than a great angel. I need God himself and nothing less will do. I need God himself and no one less will do. It's only he who can forgive. It's only he who can cleanse. It's only he who can restore. It's only he who can give me through his grace and mercy this wonderful gift 
of an eternal relationship with him. When it comes to those things, I need God and no one less. You know, the wonderful news this morning is that he has come. The wonderful news this morning is that he walks through the temple in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and has this discussion with the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The wonderful news this morning is that he is here with us. Even in lockdown, even in quarantine, when we are unable to get to our places of worship, God is here with us. This wonderful news is that he has come to where we are and he has come to do all of those things that I need him to do. He has come to put an end to my sin. He has come to pay for my sins in his body on the cross of Calvary. He has come to offer you and me his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness as we put our faith and our trust in him. God has come. God is here in Jesus Christ and he has come to do all those wonderful things. And the Bible says he has come to do more than we can ever ask or think of. This is how John puts it in one of his epistles. And we know, he says, that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. We've come to the end of our uh, weekly look then through the, the Gospel of Mark this morning. And my thanks to, uh, to you for joining me. Uh, and my thanks to you to, for staying with me, those of you who have uh, and those of you who will listen uh, as, the, as the week goes on. Um, it just remains for me to, uh, to, um, to, to say that I hope you have a lovely week uh, and a, a safe week. Um, I think the, the five mile rule has been abolished as of um, Monday and so we can get in our cars and we can do a lot more. We can go uh, a lot more places that, than we have been able to. Um, we're able to meet, I think, two households together and so it'll be a week of reunions as well. Uh, and I'm sure that it's a week closer to us getting back to some kind of normality and spending Sunday mornings having a cup of tea and then gathering together in fellowship uh, in the church. Uh, so the Lord bless you uh, and be with you for his name's sake. Amen.